All right, welcome back. We're here on uh, General Housing and Military Affairs to hear a bill introduction on H-387. H-387 was one of a number of bills that came to us uh, last year that are uh, considered within the realm of social equity bills. Um, this is a bill that was originally introduced the biennium before, and I believe it was assigned to government operations at the time, but we were assigned this bill, this biennium. And so I wanted to be able to uh, introduce it and have a walkthrough. Um, and in this case, to have the introduction and the walkthrough together prior to having um, stakeholders or other uh, interested folks come in to talk about it so and testify to it. So with that, um, Representative China, are you back? Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Great, well, welcome. Um, Thank you. Welcome back. And um, please, the microphone is yours. So it's uh, good to see you all again, twice in the same week. Um, I'm, I, do I have the ability to share a screen? No, I don't. Is, is it will in a moment if you wish. Uh, yeah, if not, I can send you the slideshow, but it might be easier if I just do it. Fine. Okay, um, you're good now. I am the co-host now. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see. I'm always afraid I'm gonna show people my to-do list and then they're gonna get vicarious trauma. All right, here we go. So, um, so H-387 is an act relating to establishing the task force to study and develop reparation proposals for the institution of shadow slavery. Uh, so I'll jump right in. So the purpose of the bill is to establish the task force um, to study and consider a state apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery and make recommendations to the General Assembly on appropriate remedies. So I'm just going to review some of the findings. There's more detail in the bill that you'll do, you'll receive during the walkthrough. But the bill, um, in the findings, we acknowledge that from 1619 to 1865. Hold on a second. I'm actually realizing that I have the House health care hearing on my phone. So I don't know if you can hear like the noise in the background, but I, I'm leaving that now. Um, so. From 1619 to 1865, approximately 4 million Africans, their descendants were enslaved in the United States and the colonies that became the United States. And from 1789 to 1865, the United States constitutionally and statutorily sanctioned the institution of slavery. And the slavery that flourished in the US constituted an immoral and inhumane deprivation of the lives, liberty, citizenship rights, and cultural heritage of Africans and denied Africans the fruits of their own labor. Furthermore, an inquiry into the ongoing effects of the institution of slavery and its legacy of persistent systemic structures of discrimination on living African-Americans and society in the United States can be based in a preponderance of academic research, legal documentation, community evidence, and culture markers. And following the abolition of slavery, the government at the federal, state, and local le level continued to perpetuate, condone, and often profit from continued practices that brutalized and disadvantaged African Americans. These practices included sharecropping, convict leasing, Jim Crow laws, redlining, unequal education, and disproportionate treatment at the hands of the criminal justice system. So um, as a result of this continued discrimination, African-Americans currently suffer debilitating economic, educational, and health hardships, including having nearly 1 million Black people incarcerated, an unemployment rate more than twice the current white employment rate, and an average of less than 1 16th of the wealth of white families, a disparity that has worsened, not improved, over time. So, the, so uh, H-387 would make a task force to study and develop reparation proposals for any person as a result of the institution of slavery. I'm not going to read you all the detail on the slide because some of this you'll review in the walkthrough. So just for the sake of, um, I think some repetition, repetition is good, but it, there's a fine balance between redundancy and um, good repetition. So, um, so it would look at the institution of slavery. It would look at the de jure and de facto discrimination against free slaves and their descendants from the end of the Civil War to the present. And 
for people who don't know Latin, the jury means um, sanctioned by the law and de facto means um, happening otherwise. I mean, that's my best way of saying it. Maybe the lawyer could cl clarify that. Um, so then um, it would also ask them to study and develop proposals as a result of the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery, the use of instructional resources and technologies to deny the inhumanity of slavery and the crime against humanity of people of African descent in Vermont and the US. They would study the role of Northern complicity in the Southern based institution of slavery and the direct benefits to public and private institutions due to slavery. They would, they're being asked to recommend appropriate ways to educate the Vermont public of their findings and to recommend appropriate remedies in consideration of those findings and to submit to the General Assembly the study that they, a study sort of of their work, which would have findings and recommendations. So the membership, I don't give a lot of detail here. The, I would summarize it as it's an 11 member task force appointed by the governor and legislature. A minimum four appointees shall represent major civil society and reparations organizations, um, such as the NAACP, Justice for All, Black Lives Matter. Members shall be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state, have experience working to implement racial justice reform, and to the extent possible, represent geographically diverse areas of the state. The duties they would identify, compile, and synthesize the relevant corpus of evidentiary documentation of the institution of slavery that existed within the U.S. and the colonies that became the United States from 1619 through 1865. Um, and some of this is a little redundant from earlier. They would recommend appropriate ways to educate the public. They would recommend appropriate remedies such as an apology, changes in policy and law, reversal of injuries compensation, rehabilitation, restitution, and other reparations. And their report would be due to the General Assembly one year from the date of the first meeting, according to the way the bill is written at this time. So just a little blurb about the history of slavery in Vermont. There has been some research and there is evidence that slavery persisted in Vermont after the, the creation of the Vermont Republic. Um, in the in Vermont Republic's constitution, Slavery was abolished with exceptions, and that continued in the Vermont Constitution, which um, was um, ratified on July 8th. I believe that's the word we use for a constitution, approved, ratified, you know, accepted, et cetera, on July 8th, 1777. Uh, here's a quote from a seven day story um, that was taken from a book put out by the Vermont Historical Society in 2014. And the book is called The Problem of Slavery in Early Vermont, 1777 to 1819. And the quote is that among the sl slaveless holding and lawless elite were Vermont Supreme Court Judge Stephen Jacob and Levi Allen, described by Whitfield as Ethan's troublesome brother. And nearly 60 years after the supposed abolition of slavery in Vermont, Ethan Allen's daughter, Lucy Carolyn Hitchcock, returned to Burlington from Alabama in possession of two slaves, a mother and child. And Hitchcock continued to enslave this pair for six years in the Queen City. Um, and another quote from an article called Disowning Slavery, Gradual Emancipation and Race in New England, 1780 to 1860, that came out in 1998. The language of the act was sufficiently vague that slaveholding may have persisted without sanction in a few cases for several years. So Although Vermont may not have the history of mass slavery that we see in the South that persisted as long, um, Vermont did have slavery continue in our state um, at least up until uh, you see here 60 years after the supposed abolition, which is quite some time. Um, and slavery still ex is allowed in our constitution. So, you know, when when we talk about systemic racism, we recognize that slavery laid the foundation for the systemic racism we see today, for the policies, laws, practices that persist. And many of these things have changed and some things haven't. So you can see here some examples and whether or not these happened in Vermont and to what extent would be determined and further understood through the work of, of this task force. Um, sharecropping, convict leasing, Jim Crow laws, redlining, unequal education, and disproportionate treatment in the criminal justice system. The, the General Assembly um, has done some work on, on systemic racism during my time in the legislature, at least, and before. I'm going to speak to just uh, my experience 
so far. So um, in 2017, we passed Act 54, and it created a task force that um, acknowledged that racial disparities within the state systems of education, labor and employment, access to housing and healthcare and economic de development. It stated that while slavery has been outlawed in this country for 150 years, the vestiges of it and of Jim Crow remain today in the form of systemic racism. And it concluded, everyone has grown up in this country Everyone who has grown up in this country is a beneficiary of a white supremacy culture. We are on a path to rever reversing this, but it will require difficult decisions. And so before I do the final slide, I just want to reflect on that for a minute, that it's the first reaction of many people would be like, it happened a long time ago. I don't see how I'm benefiting from that. But we have to keep in mind that a lot of the development of the United States was based on the backs of slaves, that slaves built the White House, that slaves, slave labor um, grew products that then came to Vermont and contributed to our economy. So even though we may not have had mass slavery in Vermont, we're part of an interconnected economy and that we as a state in some ways benefited from that. And not only that, but the national policies, the way that, um, decisions are made at the federal level, and then we implement on the state level, et cetera. They all go back to a constitution for our nation and state that treated humans as uh, in different ways. And in fact, even considering one, a human three-fifths of a person when we count them in a census, for example. So there's a lot of, there's a, there's a, there's a sad but rich history that exists. And, um, in the, you know, as many people know, I'm a clinical social worker and one of my areas of specialty is treating trauma. And when we treat trauma, um, it's important to validate and acknowledge the harm that was caused for a person. And it, it's as a society, until we face the truth. And, and when I say that, you know, this is why study is involved because there's all different stories, but if we can, Get, collect that and bring it together and present that to the public as a society that acknowledgement of the suffering is an important first step and this your committee has experience with this with the eugenics apology where you created a space for people to come forward and face a very painful past and you apologized and committed um we committed as a body to making changes moving forward so similarly here you have a similar kind of um ask which is to have a group not the committee, but a group appointed in a year to create some kind of findings and body of work so that we can tell the truth about what happened and face it, and to recommend to us as a general assembly, what are some remedies for individuals on the individual level, but also on a societal level um, to address the harm that was caused. So in closing, I'm just going to show this timeline um, of dismantling systemic racism in Vermont. So in 2017, we passed Act 54, which acknowledged racial disparity, disparities across all systems of state government. And that's the report I referred to earlier. Then in Act 9 of 2018, we committed to dismantling systemic racism, and we hired the racial equity director. Um, in 2018, H.R. 25 was introduced. Many people on this committee were co-sponsors who were around then, where we asked the Senate to amend the Constitution to ensure that slavery was completely prohibited. We didn't pass the resolution because at, when we introduced it, colleagues in the Senate expressed a commitment to doing that. And so there was no sense in going through, you know, all those motions. But it got sort of got the, the ball rolling. Um, in 2021, we passed, which I think, you know, you all, I don't know if there's anyone new on the committee since then, but because um, we've had a few, you know, seats turn over, but we passed Act 33, which uh, you all probably remember, created the Health Equity Advisory Commission, which was empowered to address disparities and to promote equity in health care. Um, we also passed JRH 6 last session, which declared that, quote, racism constitutes a public health emergency in Vermont, quote, and it committed to once again, eradicating systemic racism. So there's a long record of, well, maybe it's not that long, it's a few years, but there's a solid record at this point of our body committing to processes that um, acknowledge the harm caused by the state 
and make efforts to address the harms and to make amends. Um, and a piece of that is proposal two, which we're going to be having hearings on, I believe next Wednesday, public hearing next Wednesday at the state house. You saying that makes me cringe a little, but you know, yes, in person at the state house public hearing, um, JRH 6, 2021 of 22, I'm sorry, P proposal two. It's a proposal to amend the constitution to ensure that slavery is prohibited, to serve as a foundation for addressing systemic racism in our state's laws and institutions. And the next step would be, the logical next step would be to bring in witnesses and hear testimony and consider passing HV 87, which would establish a task force to study and develop reparation proposals for the institution of shadow slavery. So um, on that note, I'll end just by saying, um, thanking the Racial Justice Alliance that these initiatives that I just presented, every single one of them, I'm just gonna double check so that I'm correct, every single one of the bills and you know resolutions that I pre just presented to you came out of the work of the Racial Justice Alliance. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that because it's a black led organization um, with other people of color working it, in the leadership, but it's black centered, it's African-American centered. Um, and um, th that these suggestions and solutions and policy changes are coming from black leadership. Um, and I just think we need to lift up that point and honor it because part of healing is also sharing power. And you heard us talk about that the other day about with seeding powers mission. It's not just it's not just about changing where we spend money. It's about changing how we share power as a society and empowering people who have been most impacted in telling the truth and in and coming up with solutions is part of healing as a society from the wounds of our um, difficult past. Um, so that being said, I appreciate you letting me run through that. And um, I see some questions, so I'm going to let the chair step in, and I'm happy to answer questions, and I'm happy to hang around for Tucker Anderson's walkthrough, and I'm available as needed. So thank you. Um, Representative Murphy. Thank you so much, Chair Stevens. And thank you, uh, Representative Chena, for your presentation. My, my uh, comments are really just a request that you actually offer your slide deck to our committee assistant so it can be on our website as a document because it's a wonderful compilation of, of detail. Thank you. Yep. That, that, yes, I planned to do that. So I kind of wait to do that to the last minute because sometimes I, while I'm like sitting in Zoom limbo or in the, you know, on the bench, on the uncomfortable bench crammed next to seven lobbyists, I'll change something. Um, so I, uh, I will, I'll email it in when, we, when I sign off this call, or I could actually email it now, so. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Chena, this sounds like in your, in, in your presentation that um, this has, this is not a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like H96 proposes. This is um, really uh, a committee that's, that's meant to put together um, study the past, come to come to a point, and recommend whether or not anything like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, an apology, reparations, or what have you, would be um, steps to move forward in in the continuing dismantling of of systemic racism in the view of this committee. Is that right? That, I think that's a correct um, distinction to make. That this what this task force would do would be extensive research. And if you read, Tucker will go through the details because I didn't want to give a like a watered down walkthrough. I was trying to kind of do a little bit of the structure and then some historical info. Um, Tucker can get into the details, but they are given powers like with subpoena and access to records. So we're really empowering this group to bring in witnesses, to go through documentation and, and create it's sort of like um, creating a, like a uh, telling the story, you know, with 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 um, evidence, and then coming to us with recommendations. Yeah, so it's not like the group is going to make those decisions on their own. Um, if you know, I think we, as we hear from other witnesses, uh, maybe the committee would come to a different conclusion. Um, but we started out at this point because this was modeled on federal level. Um, legislation that has been brought forward over and over again for many years um, 
to look at a national process for reparations. So um, that's why we went with this approach. Um, but it is different than a truth and reconciliation process, yes. Thank you for the presentation. And again, please share your slide deck with Ron so he can post it on the, on the website. Um, but I appreciate you taking the time off from, from your work in healthcare um, to, to present to us. Tucker, is he still here? There you are. Um, welcome back. And um, you know, we're here for a, a walkthrough of this bill. So please, the microphone is yours. Thank you and good morning for the record, Tucker Anderson, the Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, it has been a little while since I have been back in this committee. So would you like me to share the bill on the screen or would you like me to walk through and you can all track along on your own devices? Um, I think it might be helpful if it were up on your up on the screen. I mean, I know we can all track along, but um, but yeah, if you could share it, that would be great. If you're comfortable doing that. I am comfortable doing that. I just have to open it in a separate panel so that we don't inadvertently share any state secrets. That's a joke. All right, can we all see the bill on the screen? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so a bit of background before jumping into the walkthrough, Representative Chia just touched upon it, but the contents of the bill that you have in front of you, H387, are based largely as in 98 to 99% on a bill that has been introduced at the federal level by Representative Conyers uh, almost every single year since 1989. Much of the findings, the purpose, and the structure come from that federal bill that is annually reintroduced, uh, with the exception of the structure of the commission, which we get into uh, in section uh, two and three of the bill, and uh, some Vermont-specific context that is built in, including some of the language. Starting in section one, uh, which covers the findings, declarations and purpose of the bill. It starts in subsection A with some findings concerning the institution of chattel slavery in the United States. Begins by stating that from 1619 to 1865, approximately 4 million Africans and their descend descendants were enslaved in the United States and the colonies. From 1789 through 1865, the United States constitutionally and statutorily sanctioned the institution of slavery. The slavery that flourished in the United States constituted an immoral and humane dep deprivation of lives, liberty, and citizenship rights and cultural heritage of Africans and denied Africans the fruits of their own labor. Uh, two of these were touched upon in Representative China's introduction of the bill. The next finding, an inquiry into the ongoing effects of the institution of slavery and its legacy of persistent systemic structures on living African Americans in society in the US can be based in a preponderance of academic research, legal documentation, community evidence, and culture markers. This finding is teeing up some of the provisions the representative China touched upon, the gathering uh, and occasional inspection of uh, documentary evidence that is available to this task force. Following the abolition of slavery, government at the federal, state, and local level continued to perpetuate, condone, and often profit from the continued practices that brutalized and disadvantaged African Americans. Again, Representative China touched upon this. The practices included sharecropping, convict leasing, Jim Crow laws, redlining, unequal education, and disproportionate treatment at the hands of the criminal justice system. As a result of both historic and continued discrimination, African-Americans currently suffer 
some of these debilitating consequences, including having nearly 1 million Black people incarcerated, an unemployment rate more than twice the current white unemployment rate, and an average of less than 1 16th of the wealth of white families, a disparity that has not improved over time. Subsection B contains the purpose of the chapter that establishes this task force. Purpose is first to study and develop reparation proposals for any person as a result of the institution of slavery, including the transatlantic and domestic slave trade that existed from 1565 through 1865 within the colonies that became the United States and the constitutional and statutory support for the institution of slavery by federal and state governments. So those are the two components of that first purpose, which is uh, study and develop reparation proposals for any person as a result of the institution of slavery. Next, the de jure and de facto discrimination against freed slaves and their descendants during that period, and Representative China nailed it. De jure means by law, de facto means by fact. So this is calling out both the legal bases for the discrimination and the factual bases for the discrimination. I apologize that my uh, dog is very interested in the context of this legislation. Atlas, move along, please. Thank you. Uh, next, the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery and the discrimination described in subdivisions one and two of this subsection B on living African Americans and on society in Vermont and the United States. The use of instructional resources and technologies to deny the inhumanity of slavery and the crime against the humanity of people of African descent. The role of Northern complicity in the Southern based institution of slavery and the direct benefits to public and private institutions, including institutions of higher education, corporations, religious institutions and other associations. Next purpose, to recommend appropriate ways to educate the Vermont public of the task force's findings, something that Representative China touched upon, to recommend appropriate remedies, and to submit to the General Assembly the study that is completed to section, in, pursuant to section two of this act, together with any recommendations. Which moves us along to the study Section two. Section two establishes the task force and assigns duties. Subsection B, the task force shall perform the following duties. First, to identify, compile, and synthesize the body of evidence of the institution of slavery that existed within the United States and the colonies from 1619 through 1865. The task force's documentation and examination shall include the facts related to. So again, these are going to be the factual and evidentiary bases for the study that is submitted. The capture and procurement of Africans, the transport of Africans to the United States and the colonies, including uh, their treatment during transport, the sale and acquisition of Africans as chattel property, in interstate and intrastate commerce, the treatment of African slaves in the colonies and the United States, including the deprivation of their freedom, exploitation of their labor, and the destruction of their culture, language, religion, and families. The extensive denial of humanity, sexual abuse, and trade of persons as chattel property, the role of federal and state governments in supporting the institution of slavery and constitutional and statutory provisions. Again, getting into the de jure bases here, the federal and state laws that have discriminated against African-Americans and their descendants. 
the other forms of discrimination in the public and private sectors against African Americans and their descendants. Examples that come up again, redlining, education funding discrepancies, and predatory financial practices. And the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery on living African Americans and society in the United States. The task force is also uh, required to recommend appropriate ways to educate the Vermont public of their findings and to recommend appropriate remedies in consideration of those findings. In making these recommendations, the task force shall address each of the following components. How the recommendations comport with international standards of remedy for wrongs and injuries caused by the state, which shall include uh, reparations and special measures as understood by relevant international protocols. How the state of Vermont will offer a formal apology on behalf of the people of Vermont for the perpetration of gross human rights violations and crimes against humanity. How Vermont laws and policies that continue to disproportionately and negatively affect African Americans as a group and how those that perpetuate the lingering effects, both material and psychosocial, can be eliminated. How the injuries resulting from matters described within this section two, and of course in the research of the task force can be reversed and provide appropriate policies, programs, projects, and recommendations. How any form of compensation to the descendants of enslaved persons should be calculated. What form of compensation should be awarded through what instrumentalities and who should be eligible for that compensation. Finally, how in consideration of the task force's findings, any other forms of rehabilitation or restitution is warranted and what the form and scope of those measures should take. So to sum each of those uh, descriptive criteria, summing that up, once they've investigated the de jure and de facto bases, uh, both for historical uh, slavery and for ongoing institutions of discrimination, how they have recommendations for how to remedy moving forward each of those, which may include reparations. Subsection C ends the section by requiring that the task force submits a written report of its findings and recommendations to the General Assembly, not later than the date that is one year after the first meeting of the task force. So they have one year after the task force is brought together to uh, provide this report to the General Assembly. Section three, government operations nitty gritty. This is the membership of the task force. The task force shall consist of 11 members that shall be appointed as follows. First, three members will be appointed by the governor, not more than two of whom shall be from one political party. The other eight members shall be appointed by the General Assembly, four by the Senate, four by the House, and of course, the powers there are the Senate Committee on Committees and the Speaker of the House. Not more than four of those eight shall be members of the General Assembly. And each appointing authority, Senate and House, shall appoint not more than two members from the same political party. At minimum, four of those eight shall represent major civil society and reparations organizations that have historically championed the cause of repertory justice. Members shall be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state, have experience working to implement racial justice reform, and to the extent possible, uh, represent geographic diversity uh, through the areas of the state. The terms of office for the members shall be for the life of the task force, which is uh, one year after the task force is convened, that report gets submitted and we'll get to it later, but the expiration of the task force follows that. 
a vacancy in the task force shall not affect the powers of the task force. If someone leaves, that isn't going to, uh, for some reason, dissolve this body. And it shall be filled in the same manner as the original appointment. So if a member leaves for some reason and it was a senatorial appointment, the Senate Committee on Committees gets to appoint uh, for that vacancy. The dates that we're going to get to in this section are no longer relevant, uh, but we will cover them. The governor shall call the first meeting of the task force to occur on or before January 1st. We've passed the current date in the bill, but that can be amended. Seven members of the task force shall constitute a quorum. Uh, that's seven out of 11. Something to keep in mind from a government operations perspective, this affects things such as the ability for final action to be taken by the task force at a given meeting, all the way through whether or not uh, a gathering of members constitutes a quorum for purposes of the open meeting law. Uh, the task force is given authority to elect their own chair and vice chair from among, among their membership. So there won't be an appointed chair, unlike some other task forces you may have dealt with. Subsection F deals with the compensation of the membership. Uh, these are the standard provisions you see for many of your commissions and task forces. There is a separate compensation statute for uh, members of the General Assembly when they're not in session and for other members who are compensated pursuant to 32 VSA section 1010. The limitation on compensation is 20 meetings and uh, the money that will be paid for those per diems and compensation is going to be appropriated directly to the task force. Section four, this deals with some of the powers that Representative Chena briefly touched upon, such as the ability to acquire documentation, uh, to uh, subpoena individuals for testimony, um, so we'll start subsection A, dealing with hearings and sessions of the task force. For the purposes of carrying out uh, the provisions of this chapter, this bill, the task force, and this is permissive, may hold hearings and sit and act at any time and location in Vermont. They can request the attendance and testimony of witnesses, request the production of evidence and documentation, um, and they may seek an order from the civil division of the Superior Court compelling testimony or compliance with a subpoena. They can ask the judicial branch here to intervene and compel the production of evidence or potentially the appearance and presentation of testimony. The powers of subcommittees and members, any subcommittee or member of the task force may, if it's author authorized by the greater body, take any action the task force is authorized to take pursuant to the section. So the task force can vote to delegate some of their powers and authority to subcommittees or individual members uh, to carry out the purposes of the chapter. The task force may acquire directly from the head of any department agency or instrumentality of the executive branch, uh, information that the task force considers useful in the discharge of its duties. All of those uh, departments and agencies shall cooperate with the task force with respect to that information and furnish it as requested by the task force and to the extent permitted by law. When this information comes to the task force, the task force shall keep that information confidential to the extent that it is confidential or exempt from the Public Records Act. So any exemptions from the PRA, any confidentiality that's related to that information carries to the task force, and so would any duties of confidentiality. Section five, we uh, deal with some of the administrative structures around the task force. Task force is permitted to appoint and fix compensation of personnel as the task force considers appropriate. They will have the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the Human Rights Commission. They have some contracting power here. They may procure supplies, services, and property by contract. 
They may enter into contracts with departments, agencies, and instrumentalities of the United States, state agencies, or private firms and institutions for the conduct of research or surveys, the preparation of reports, and other activities that are necessary for the discharge of their duties that we covered in section three. Section six uh, is the expiration of the task force. The task force shall terminate 30 days after the date on which the report is submitted to the General Assembly. So that would be not later than 30 days, one year after the task force is assembled. Section seven contains the appropriation. $200,000 is appropriated from the general fund to the Human Rights Commission for the purpose of per diem compensation, reimbursement of expenses, and the discharge of duties and powers granted to the task force by this act. And the effective date was July 1st, 2021. And that can be amended so that we have retroactive formation of the task force and subsequent expiration. Those are the words on the page. Thank you for, for um, taking us through that. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I have a question about words on the page. So I think it's appropriate at this time. I'm still trying to figure out when we ask what, but in section four on page 10 under powers, um, when we get to number three, re request the production of, in my mind, that means we could, we could be saying you can request that something actually be made as opposed to brought forward. And so is that just me not taking the, the lawyer view of the definition of production? Yes, uh, production in legalese in the term of art means you send it to me, not necessarily that you create. So we often draw a legal distinction between the creation of a record and the production, uh, you know, pursuant to a subpoena or some sort of formal request. I had a feeling, but I just wanted to verify. Thanks. Representative Bloomley. Thanks, Chair. Um, while we have Representative Chino with us, uh, I, I had a broader question. Um, we took testimony on H-273 um, earlier, and I am wondering um, how those two bills are related or aligned in any way. May I answer? Yes, please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, they are aligned. Um, when you look at the findings of H-273, it makes the case um, based on research that Seeding Power did to compile those findings. Um, it makes the case that systemic racism exists and it's affected wealth disparity for not only black people, but also indigenous people and other people of color. And it proposes a solution, one um, specific intervention that the state could do in terms of how it invests money and distributes power. Um, so I see a connection there because one could say that H-273 is an example of one kind of reparation. Um, so I see a connection there for sure. Um, what I, I, I would say to, that we, it would be beneficial for us to make, to continue making, taking acts of reparation, regardless of whether or not we do further study. In other words, like there's a, there's enough findings out there it's, and we've passed enough legislation where we've acknowledged there's a problem that to say, oh, we shouldn't take action. We need to look into it more. I think we're past that point. Um, we've already taken actions and other, you know, it's like I showed you before the timeline and there's more. There's the ethnic uh, and social equity studies bill. There's other examples we could give. Um, however, I feel like what we do, so if I'm trying to think of like an analogy, it's like, 
you you have a house and you know there's it's an old house you know we live in vermont I, I we most of us live in old many of us live in old houses you know you know the old house has 80 things that need to be fixed you know and you just don't have the time resources or energy to fix them all at once and in fact there's not even the workforce to do that right so you do what you 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 know if you're like me you try not to wait till it's an emergency you try to plan ahead but the reality is sometimes you're like oh i guess i'm doing that thing now because this just happened you know and i feel like that's the approach we've been taking where we know there's all these problems and we're like well this year we're going to fix the windows next year we're going to paint you know the next year maybe we'll do the heating system but i don't know yet but ultimately the foundation needs to be fixed you know and until we fix, we can keep fixing everything else. But if the foundation is off, then things are going to crack again. Things are going to break again. So I think that, you know, it's as we continue moving forward with dismantling racism, we have to get to the root. And we're taking, hopefully taking a step with proposal two, the voters will decide ultimately. That's who decides to amend the constitution. But I think us bringing it to the voters, and even if it did not pass, it raises public awareness. I tend to think it would pass. Um, because most people don't want slavery in the Constitution. Um, at this point, most people don't believe slavery should exist. Um, but I, I bring that up because it's all interconnected. And so we could be fixing the foundation while fixing the windows, but it would be good at some point to take stock of all the problems in the house and to make a strategic plan, like a capital plan of what we're going to do when and what timeline, because then, and that's what this work could give us, because if a group took the time and energy and had the resources to do a comprehensive study and compilation and an official public record of the state that acknowledges how slavery happened here, how we benefited, all the things you heard, then, and they gave us some ideas, we could construct a roadmap over the next few years. And then looking back, really be able to say that as a society, we faced the problems of the past took a step forward. However, while we're doing that doesn't mean we shouldn't fix anything. And so I think we should pass, pass proposal to, to, I think we should pass H273 and other um, equity bills that are spread all through our committees. But I also don't think do I, it's not mutually exclusive. Like doing that won't erase the need for this and we could do all that. And we might look back in 10 years and say, we missed a bunch of things because we didn't really look hard at the past and create that space as a society to face the trauma and to heal. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my musings on how they're all connected. Um, oh, are you all set? No, it's all right. Yeah, I'm upset for now. Thank you. All right, Representative Walsh. Uh, thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, I've got a, this might sound like nitpicking, but I've got a question. I wonder if uh, the definition of the potential beneficiaries is a little bit too restrictive. It seems as if we're limiting this to Africans who are brought here or the living descendants of those Africans brought here uh, because of slavery. And it seems to be that might exclude a number of people who would be equally deserving and uh, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, for example, Jamaicans, who perhaps were not directly brought here from Africa, but it was a way station, and they're not living descendants of those slaves. Or people from any African country who came here voluntarily, for example, during the 20th century, and were subject to Jim Crow and, and those other systemic racism issues that you raise. So is, I'm, I don't know if you want to try to broaden that definition or if that's a real problem, or is that something to leave to the task force to try to define? Uh, rep, uh, Tucker? Uh, Representative Waltz, that was something that we were particularly um, aware of when the bill was being put together. And I will note for you that when you get to the operative provisions of the bill, it specifically uses the term person. So uh, for example, in uh, section, let's take a look at this, both sections one and two, when it 
discusses the study and development of reparation proposals. It is for any person as a result of practices and institutions that are then listed below that. So it's not specific to any particular group uh, or category. It's for any person uh, that is either a descendant of or a uh, party that is directly affected by any of the institutions or practices that come later. Uh, furthermore, when you get to the section of the bill that deals with the task force and its recommendations, one of the uh, duties that they have in developing both the study and the proposals that result from the study is to examine within Vermont's context who should be a beneficiary based on the particularized history that they are studying. That will come back to the General Assembly and you can make decisions from there. May, may okay, I also thank you wait? For that explanation. That would seem to capture my concern. Thank you. May, may I also weigh in, Chair? I'm assuming yes. It looks like you know. Yes, 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 okay, yes, yes. 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 I, I, um, I'm trying to just be more aware because on Zoom sometimes you can't tell like things. Okay. Yep. Um, that um, just to expand a bit on what Tucker said, that the bill was written centering African Americans who descended from the institution of slavery in America, but it isn't it 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 we we try to acknowledge that there's circles beyond that group, you know, circles around that initial group that are impacted. And the further you get from the center, the perhaps the less the impact, perhaps not. But we really tried to center, start by centering Americans of African descent who's who came from uh, had roots in the you know in the institution of slavery, people who have descended from enslaved persons. But one could say that if you were Jamaican, uh, you're most likely you know if you're an African of African descent from Jamaica, you're most likely a descendant of slavery, uh, you know, of an enslaved person. So that's another layer. But then, so, but then another layer. Or you mentioned um, recent immigrants from Africa, although their families may have faced a completely different leg legacy of colonization that's interconnected with the slave trade and what, and what, what happened on earth over the last 400, 500 years. Um, they're not impacted the same as immigrants, but they are impacted by systemic racism. Um, and so that, you know, so they're another circle. And then we could, we go further and we would say that other people of color have faced harm because of systemic racism that's rooted in slavery before those groups were even on the continent. And we're not even talking about indigenous people in, in this discussion yet, who had a whole other story of oppression and who were also enslaved, you know, at, um, at times, you know, so it, it, it really, I, I appreciate Tucker's point because the task force is to study and develop reparation proposals for any person. We did say that. And then we go on to center um, black people who descended, uh, who are descendants of enslaved people and, and go outward. So I hope that also helps a bit that the, it was deliberate to center and, and lift up the struggle of the people who have suffered the longest from it in this place with but we didn't but there but we want to also acknowledge that it affects many others so and the benefits go the same way too that the that even even people who have descended from slavery benefit from the institution of slavery you know in way in some ways and you know because it built the economy we have so if somebody you know, climbs the ladder, so to speak. Let's say somebody is a descendant of an enslaved person, but they become wealthy investing in companies that are rude, you know, that started from exploiting slave labor in some way, even though that person has faced harm, they're also benefiting. So it actually gets really complicated and we need to think about that um, as part of the process too. I'll stop there, but just that's just some more thoughts about um, the harm that slavery has caused and the benefits it caused. And, and you know, I think the question is um, who, was, who faced what in that equation, so. Thank you. Um, Representative Parsons. Thank you. I was gonna save this until if we got, if we went further with this, but I, since the conversation's going, I might as well go along with it. Um, I think the past five minutes really brings up one of the reasons that reparations has always been kind of on the back burner is because you either cast too narrow of a net to really capture um, people who may have suffered from it. And 
and then you start growing it out and you just you can't stop it's really hard to stop growing as representative china said growing those circles around from that you know from that central central group where do you draw that line where you say all right we're stopping expanding this circle and that's in my opinion where it's always come down to where the the struggle is because you can't i mean like you said um should reparations go to a um a black millionaire or do we cap it at do we cap it as uh, as your net wealth you may have you may be in that small group but now you're flourishing are you out of that small group now there's just so many variables in it that you know, the impossible, and I think that's why it hasn't happened, is because it probably is to try and, um, I don't know, put a dollar yeah, amount yeah. on somebody's suffering, I guess. I don't know what the goal is. but No, it, it's, clearly, it's clearly been difficult. And it's, um, and I think the, the question here in this bill is, should there be a task force that can, can, de can delve in not just to the philosophy of that, of that but of, of what a possible solution might be and, 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 and present it back to us. That's, that's the question in the bill. Um, I, and uh, I guess just to expand on that, I, I understand it, but this isn't the first committee that's been, or group that's tried, has been done over and over and over and over, and that's why it always stalls in my opinion, is that you just, I appreciate wanting to have that committee to try and figure that out. That committee has been had multiple, multiple, multiple times throughout this country. And I think finding that group of people and where you, where the cutoff line is, is always kind of where it ends. All right, any further questions for Tucker or for Brian at this time? Can I, can I ask Tucker a question? Sure. I, I, that might seem unusual. Yeah, well, just because Representative Parsons, you you said that it's um, been tried before. I know this has been discussed, but I wanted to ask Tucker, because um, I who has actually passed reparations task force? I think the city of Burlington currently has one, but they haven't finished their work yet. Who else has passed one in our, you know, and actually done this? I'm not specific to Vermont, just to throw that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was asking okay. Tucker, like, you know, yeah, yeah like, because Tucker may know this, and if not, this might be an area to take some testimony, but. Uh, so I would recommend bringing in some folks to give you testimony on this. Here is what I'm aware of. The uh, commissions and task forces that have been tried in the past focused on very discrete issues and populations. So uh, in the United States, the only one that I'm aware of was in Maine, and it dealt with the indigenous populations in Maine, and very specifically uh, with the, uh, what were known at the time in Maine as the Indian schools in Maine. And it dealt with the dissolution of native families in that state. Uh, outside of the United States, uh, there have been truth and reconciliation commissions that have dealt with very specific pro proposals and the most notorious would be in South Africa. And I can send you the materials that I have, but again, I would recommend bringing in someone uh, who has done more meticulous and detailed research on the perhaps more specifically international bodies because that is a component of this bill. It speaks very specifically to uh, addressing and perhaps adopting international protocols for these recommendations. Uh, so looking at some of the international bodies that have been created around truth and reconciliation, reparations, um, and similar issues. And thank you, Representative China, for taking time out of your day to present this bill um, and to Tucker for walking us through it. And we will um, we will um, start to put together a list of, of, of stakeholders and folks who um, perhaps Brian people who who are part of the Racial Justice Alliance and 
others um, who can discuss the histories that that might be involved with this um, as if as we move forward with it um, in conversation. All right, everybody, it's um, eleven thirty. And I think I'm going to call it lunch time. Um, unless anybody had any further comments on, on, you know, to go back to where we were before talking and talking about any of the, the particular legislation that, that we've dealt with, or we can, you know, we can just take the break now. And um, I don't know, is it warm enough to take a walk yet? Um, yeah, let's just do that. And um, Re Representative Murphy. Thanks, Chair Stevens. I just was gonna ask, um, I know we've had at least one bill, and of course I'm totally blanking on what it was, where people had questions and, and it was suggested we'd bring in some witnesses and stuff. And um, so as, as we do have bills come to our agenda, if you could, um, send out a highlight or, or tag any for us that are at a place where, you know, we, we can do the deeper dive where we should be asking those questions um, or, or say, if that's the level we're coming to on this bill, are we gonna be hearing from this group or person? Just if there's some, okay, I'm starting to kind of lose track of where in the shoot many of our focuses are. Yeah, no, I, that's that's fair because there's going to be a lot of distractions. What with a lot of the new bills, some of this we still have bills that haven't been introduced from last year. We are going to get a number of bills uh, this year, so um, so yes, that's totally fair about uh, you know just to make clear. And I, again, some of, sometimes you'll know by the numbers, right? You know, anything past four seventy something, um, like the bill I brought up today, that's this year, anything before that is last year. Uh, but yeah, no, totally fair. Uh, just in terms of in terms of what level of preparation um, folks want to go into. Yep. Well, and just trying to help you with what you want us to be ready to do. Whether whether we should be ready to think that you know this is closing out today, or this is one that we can put in some thoughts for a further look. Yep, I agree. I, I hear you. Representative Walsh. Uh, thank you. I don't remember exactly when I did this. I think it was two years ago. I put together a report for the Committee on Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. I can resend that, though it's more along the lines of truth and reconciliation rather than this much bigger scope of, of this task force. But I also have details of what the main commission do, did. Uh, the one that Tucker Anderson referred to, both sure. very short documents. I can send them to Ron and send them out to the committee. And I think, um, you know, perhaps again, a, a potential area of study for on 387.2 would be um, Evanston, Illinois just had uh, last year instituted well, they actually tried to make their first payouts of a, of, of a reparations plan, but they had put money aside several years ago, called them reparations, and then have been trying to figure out how to distribute mm. funds in a way. And so that would be a, an area that we could look into as well, but that's not for today. Um,